And it's kind of a fear for those of us that are drinkers that you're not going to be able to socialize as much or have as much fun. But it's amazing how I enjoyed it just as much and I didn't have the effects that some of the other people had the next morning, you know? And, and that was profound for me because that was always a fear, like if I couldn't do this anymore, you know, be with my friends and, and socialize in this way. Welcome everybody, it's Katie with Thrive Alcohol Recovery and I'm back again today with another Sinclair Method success story. I love doing these interviews because it gives me a chance to hear from others who've gone through the Sinclair Method um, and really tell their personal story because I'm only one person who went through my own TSM journey and I just love bringing others into the mix. And I know um, our listeners love it too. They get so much out of these because you know, you're going to be talking today to people who are new to the method or maybe halfway through. And it's, um, it's really awesome just to be able to uh, hear from someone who's already done it themselves. So today I have with me, Jamie, and I just want to thank you so much, Jamie, for taking time to chat with me today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Awesome. Well, I hope you don't mind. I just kind of want to start at the beginning so people can understand what your drinking was like um, you know, before you started on the Sinclair Method. So would you mind telling us a little bit about your personal history with alcohol use and what led you into TSM? Yes. Um, so I, I grew up in Wisconsin. So um, I was in the bars quite frequently with my parents. Um, and you kind of started drinking quite young in Wisconsin. And the drinking age when I was in Wisconsin years ago was 18. So I partied quite a bit in high school and college. And then um, after my senior year of college, I kind of quit because I just saw that it just really wasn't doing much for me. And I really didn't drink for probably a good 25 years. I got married, had three kids, uh, got my master's in education. And once my children were old enough to go to school, I went back and decided to go into full-time teaching. And it was when I started full-time teaching and I was teaching at a middle school, very interesting ages of students. And um, we just started, teachers, we kind of would go to the bar after work once in a while. And so I just started drinking some wine and um, it just took a hold of me. Um, so after not drinking for probably 25, 30 years, I started again. And that was, I was probably about 40 when I started again. Um, drinking. And then it just kept going. And then it was drinking at home and, you know, drinking alone at home. I was definitely an alone drinker. I like, I enjoyed that drinking by myself. My husband doesn't drink at all, never has. So it was kind of an interesting dynamic that we had. Um, and it just escalated from there. So you started drinking, that's really interesting because it was kind of later in life and it sounds like you started drinking socially with your teaching colleagues, but then it transitioned into home alone drinking. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And alcoholism runs in my family. Uh, my grandfather, who I never met, died of cirrhosis of the liver at the age of 42. Um, and my, both my parents, my, my father passed away of cholangeal carcinoma about six years ago. And it, it's very rare, but it happens in males older, later in life who were heavy drinkers. And my parents both were daily drinkers. I mean, if you didn't see a beer in their hand, it was very unusual. Um, and then once they retired, they drank a lot more and it ended up taking both of them in their seventies. Um, it just wore them down. Wow. So, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, because I was a real big partier in high school and college. I mean, really big. And um, then I decided just to stop. And it wasn't hard to stop when I was a senior in college. It, I just stopped. I just said, one day I'm, I'm done. Huh. And that didn't happen the second time around. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Because when I started drinking too, um, in my teenage college years, I really didn't care about it. I, I would drink quite a bit, but I could easily stop for weeks or a month and not really think about it. And so I can somewhat relate with what you went through with that. And then when I tried to stop for real before TSM, it was like, oh, it's not working like it used to. I don't have that same control. So 
Wow. I'm just curious to ask, how old were your kids about when you started noticing alcohol use disorder tendencies? Um, they were out of, they were out of high, well, my, my youngest was probably about 16. Okay. So I had three sons and my oldest was probably about 22 at the time. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious. Oh, go ahead. Well, we had, and our kids were very involved in high school sports. So they were all played football. And so we had these parties called fifth quarters after the football games on Friday nights, where all the parents would meet at a certain, you know, people's house, we take turns and there'd be food and a lot of alcohol. <laughs> and that just kind of, you know, encouraged me to go that route too. So it really became a big part of our life after not having alcohol for 25, 30 years, all of a sudden I was drinking with, you know, my coworkers and then drinking with friends, um, during these activity, you know, after activities that we would go to. Yeah. Because yeah. Let's face it, drinking is so, such a common thing, you know, in social situations, it's just a given most of the time. And it seems like even more so now, I just feel like, I mean, I started noticing it years ago, but it just seems like it's acceptable to have alcohol everywhere at a kid's birthday party, even in the town I used to live in grocery stores would have a bar and it was like, you go grocery shopping, you can get a beer while you shop. It's like, what are movie theaters with alcohol now? So it really is everywhere. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so I'm curious, how did you, like, you started drinking heavily around your early forties. How long was it lasting for where it was starting to become, you know, excessive drinking habits? Well, it got to the point where, um, I was hung over quite often and it's really hard to teach middle schoolers when you're hung over. Um, and then what I would do was at this time too, my husband was working second shift. So when I would come home, I would be, it would just be me and maybe our youngest son, you know, and he was doing his own thing. Um, so I had a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of that alone drinking, you know, and um, cause my husband really had no idea how bad it had gotten for me. I was very good at keeping that a secret. And so Friday nights were like my, I would just let loose because it, you know, a rough week of working and I'd come home and I'd start drinking the minute I got home and I could drink until two or three in the morning. And then I couldn't do anything on Saturdays because I was so hungover. And I, I knew it was a problem. And I, you know, how you kind of tell yourself, well, you got to get a hold of this. You know, you got to get control of this. And you always plan to. And there were moments where I would quit. You know, I would quit for maybe a week or two. I don't think I could go longer than a, two weeks, though. Yeah. And then I would just have to have, have it again. You know, it was such a habit for me. Like it was very hard for me to even watch TV, a TV program or a movie without having a glass of wine in my hand. They just kind of went together because that was like the best way to relax after a long day. So I knew, I knew it was a problem. I, I really did. Even though I was ignoring it, yeah. I knew, I knew yeah. it was a problem. Yeah. It's like, we know, especially those Saturday mornings, waking up and totally hungover and you're like, oh, why did I do that last night? But it's like that Friday anticipating it while you're still at work and looking forward to it. It's such this internal conflict because on one hand, we love it. It gives us this relief and this reward. But then on the other hand, overdoing it just causes these massive consequences. So it's just this, I feel like we're in this trap in some way with it. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And I knew with my family history, yeah. that it was, you know, I, I just knew it wasn't good. And if I didn't get control of it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work well for me in yeah. the long term. Yeah. And um, yeah. So how so. many years were you struggling for, would you say from like when it started to become excessive to when you found TSM? I would say probably, probably, I mean, it doesn't seem possible, but I started out very slowly when I turned like in my forties, you know, I would say it was probably a good 10, 10 to 15 years yeah. of struggling with it and trying to stop and stopping sometimes and then starting again and knowing it was a problem, but I couldn't really control it. Yeah. 
And so right before you st started on the Sinclair method, what did your drinking look like, if you will, like a day in the week? Like people often want to understand, like, what was your drinking pattern? Can I relate to it? Is mine similar? Um, so what did a week in the life look like for you? Well, I would probably consume at least one to two bottles of wine every night. Yeah. And that was weeknights. Um, Friday nights, I could consume two to three bottles. Mm -hmm. Um, Saturdays I'd go a little bit easier because my husband was home then, um, and maybe have one bottle, but yeah, I was consuming quite a few bottles of wine a week. Yeah. yeah. I'm amazed at how much my story is very similar to yours. Just everything you're saying where you were hiding it from your husband, you were drinking at least a bottle or two of wine, uh, Friday nights was your like night to go crazy. I, exactly, exactly <laughs> the same for me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, um, when did you learn about the Sinclair method and how did you learn about the Sinclair method? Well, it's very interesting. So during this whole time of me struggling, uh, my youngest son ended up, uh, graduating from high school and went to college and, um, he developed, a he developed it, alcoholism. Um, you know, we, my husband and I would talk to him and, um, it just was getting progressively worse for him. Um, he's definitely a binger and would just take weeks off of work and just get drunk mm -hmm. and be drunk the whole time. And so we were kind of going through the struggles with him and, um, he had a particularly really bad experience with it. And my husband was very upset about it. And, um, he had called me, my husband, and I was actually mowing the lawn <laughs> and, um, so after he was very upset and we kind of, I kind of talked him off the ledge and said, well, we'll talk about it when you get home. And so I continued mowing the lawn and I remember just praying. And, um, I just said, God, you know, we have to have something because this is not working. I need a miracle is what I said. And so I got off the lawnmower and we had an in-ground pool. And traditionally when I got off and stopped mowing the lawn, I would just go sit out by the pool because it was so peaceful. And I get on my iPad and just kind of read or, or just look up things, social media. And so I went out there and I opened my iPad and it was quite fascinating because the thing that showed up on my iPad was the cure for alcoholism. Wow. And it was a Ted talk by, uh, uh, what's Claudia her? Christian. Yes. Claudia Christian. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's no cure for alcoholism. So I listened to the TED talk and I was fascinated by it. I was like, why haven't I known about this? And so um, I began researching immediately and I did find a doctor um, in our area. And I remember telling my son and my husband about it and I was so excited. And um, so we actually ended up going to this doctor with my son and he did start the program. He never really followed through with it, you know, because the buzz was so important to him. He just wouldn't take the pill. Yeah. That's where, just where he was at. Um, and so, but I was so invested in it because I wanted so much to help my son. And I wasn't even thinking of my own problem at that point, because I was so focused on trying to help him. Um, and so I ended up getting the book, um, the cure for alcoholism. And I, I was reading that and, um, there was like a little inventory, a questionnaire that you answered. And if you answered so many, then you had a problem. And I knew right then and there at, cause I failed that. I mean, I, you know, I had so many of those issues and I'm like, okay, I have a problem with drinking. I got to deal with it. And then I got on the C3 foundation website and found a doctor online and uh, made an appointment, I think within two weeks and started on the program at that point. Wow. I got chills and you were saying you were praying and then led to this because I have lost count. How many people have told me that this treatment is an answer to prayer. So I am just amazed at how that was true for you. And you weren't even looking for yourself. You were looking for your son, but here you are today, completely free because of this treatment. That's incredible. Yes. It's amazing how God works that way. Yeah, it really yeah. is. I, so many people have told me that and it always makes me smile. Cause I'm just like, thank you, God. That's yeah life-changing yeah. for people. Yep, exactly. So I know people are going to want to know, do you want to mention how your son is doing now since he couldn't do the method? Um, you know, he, we went through, it's been a battle with him. 
Yeah. Um, actually, the week before Christmas, he um, he was hospitalized and he was medically induced in a coma oh, no. to save his life because he had gone on a I think it was a two to three week bender, and um, he was staying in a hotel and he was thank God he called an ambulance because he knew he was in bad shape. Um, so he's out. He's living with us. Um, right now he's, because I talked to the doctor that, um, I use for TSM and because of the health issues that my son has right now with, he's got liver disease now. Mm -hmm. Um, he just doesn't, he said that he probably can't do this right now, TSM. Um, so he, my son is, you know, doing cold Turkey right now, you know, it's a struggle for him. Um, it's kind of a work in progress. You know, I may continue to, the doctor at the hospital said, as long as he doesn't drink, his liver will repair itself. And I'm hoping at some point, if it's still, the cravings are still an issue for him, that maybe he could do TSM again someday. But he was one of those that just struggled with doing it because he wanted that buzz so bad, you know, and, um, it, I, I don't know why, because I just felt for me, it was pretty, not easy, but it was the best way to do it. Yeah. But I just couldn't get him to do that. Yeah. But you really have to want this. And I don't know if he was ever at that point yeah. until he got to this point now where he doesn't have many other choices. Yeah. So. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry to hear that. I, yeah, I just hope and pray that he gets free, even if, you know, whatever method works for him. I have loved ones that had to quit cold Turkey as well due to health issues and they've been able to stay sober. So I'm very grateful for that. And I think you're right. It's at the end of the day, we have to want it and we have to be willing to experience a different kind of buzz. Cause it does change that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, in the book, the cure for alcoholism, it talks about how compliance is a challenge for some people. And I think that's why, you know, this method doesn't have a hundred percent success rate because not everyone's going to, you know, take the medication as prescribed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I guess back to your story now, um, when did you start on the Sinclair method? What year was that? Um, it was, um, 2020, 2020. Okay. Yeah. So Beginning you 2020, what, what was your response when you first started? What did, what was your experience like on naltrexone? How, how were you when you first started? Um, you know, I went through the normal, I think you get some of that nauseousness, you know, but my doctor just recommended, you know, eating a meal and drinking ginger ale with it when I took the pill. And that's what I did. And it really took care of the problem for me. So I did that for the first, maybe two, three weeks. And then I didn't have to do that anymore. And that wasn't a problem. That side effect went away for me. Um, I was a hundred percent compliant from day one. I just wanted, I just wanted to feel good again so badly. And I didn't want to be controlled by this thing any longer. So I wasn't going to risk not taking that pill. So I would come home from school and I, I take the pill and I wait the hour and I would just have a couple of drinks. And the interesting thing for me is I could pretty much stick with just two drinks a night. I really got that mm feeling, you know, where I just didn't need it anymore. And many times I would only have one glass of wine a night and I couldn't do a second. But I was never one that had many AF days during my journey. I just, because I always felt like I'm not going to white knuckle it and try to force this. So I just always pretty much took the pill every day. I did limit myself though. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take the pill until about four or five in the afternoon. Um, unless it was something like on a Saturday where we had a party or something and I knew I might drink then I would take it, you know, before that. But, um, I pretty much stuck with two to maybe three drinks a night for my whole journey. And I maybe had one or two AF days the whole time. Wow. Okay. So that's interesting. Going from someone who's drinking at least one to two bottles of wine a night, it sounds like you pretty quickly dropped down to the two or three glasses. Was that, did that happen rapidly or was there a period of time for you to reduce to that? That happened pretty rapidly. And I was wow. kind of surprised by that, you know, um, because I, 
I just remember reading in the, in that book that, and even hearing Claudia talk, you wait until you get that, ma, uh, you know, that yeah, where like, you meh. Eh, yeah. eh, don't really need it anymore. And that really happened probably between one or two drinks for me. And I'm like, no, I don't need any more. And um, so, yeah, it, I don't know why, but it just happened for me that way, which I'm very thankful. Now, it's not to say that during that journey, because it took me 16 months to re- till I reached extinction. Um, there were times, I think there were two episodes where I, where I really drank through the nail and, um, you know, kind of, and I hated it. I hated how I felt. I hated how I felt the next morning. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Yeah. So yeah, it really, from day one, it really went pretty well in that sense. You know, when I commend the more times. And I commend you too, for just, because I think sometimes like we talk about drinking through the naltrexone and sometimes people get that kind of meh feeling, but the habit kicks in and they kind of ignore it and keep drinking anyway. So for you, like clearly you were drinking mindfully enough to notice that. And then when you noticed it, you said, okay, I guess I've had enough. And you consciously chose to stop where I think sometimes people are challenged with, I notice it, I don't want another drink, but I keep drinking anyway. But sounds like that wasn't the case for you because I don't know, what would you say? Were you just really motivated? Like you said, you were tired of this problem. Why do you think that is that you were able to respond that way? I think it was the motivation. I think I wanted so badly to be free of this and I did not want something else controlling my life. Yeah. So I, I, that's all I can chalk it up to is my motivation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that motivation helps with the compliance piece too. Cause I would say I was in the same boat as well, where I was like 10 out of 10, I'm committed to this. I'm never going to drink without naltrexone. I just want this issue fixed. And so that I feel even on the days where I was tempted to not comply or tempted to drink through it. It was that motivation and that desire for change was always kind of burning within me just to like get this issue over with so I can kind of move on from it and live my life. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So you were on it uh, for 16 months and you said you didn't really have any or very few alcohol free days during that time. Is that right? Right. Yeah. 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 I incredible. just felt like I'm going to take the pill and I'm going to have a couple glasses of wine. And I, you know, and I, I was on all the Facebook groups for TSM and all that. And they were always recommending, you know, try to fit in a couple AFA days, you know, this week. And, you know, I contemplated, but I'm like, you know what, that's, that's what this pill is for, for me not to have to, I didn't really want to go without, I still had that, you know, that comfort in it, I guess. But then when I did take the pill and I drank, I could, I could shut it off. So I'm like, well, this is not a problem. I can do this, yeah. you know? And I, I didn't know how long it was going to take me, but I just was patient with it. And I figured, well, someday, eventually I just won't want it at all. Wow. Yeah. Cause you were drinking at such a low level. It's not like you were yeah. having those consequences anymore. So I could understand why, you know, you didn't really feel like the need for alcohol-free days. And I just hope people listening will feel encouraged by that because some people get alcohol-free days in the first week and other people, it takes months and months. And so for people to know just because you haven't had an alcohol-free day and you're a ways into the method, it doesn't necessarily mean it's you know not working for you or that it won't come at some point in the future. Exactly, exactly. And that was one thing that the 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 Facebook pages and such really encouraged me and the doctor that I was meeting with for uh, the Sinclair method, um, everybody's journey is just so different, you know? And you just, you have to work it out. And you just have to get to that point where you're gonna work it out for yourself. And you can't worry so much about, cause some days I felt guilty that I didn't have enough AF days. <laughs> but I'm like, you know what? And my doctor would tell me, no, this is your journey. You do what you, think you need to do with this and he said you're doing great because you're not having that much you know yeah so and yeah and then one day so when I finally reached extinction it was actually July 18th 2021 and I it it was in the evening and I took my nail and I went to pour a glass of wine and I remember looking at it and I'm like ugh, I have no desire to drink you And I poured it down the drain 
And I literally maybe have drank twice since then. One was at a wedding and one was at Christmas. Wow. And I had one glass of wine at each event because I just, I always took my nail, of course, but, but even now I just, and I think you are kind of in the same boat. If I kind of heard you talk on some of your other podcasts and stuff, I just have no desire for it. Yeah. I mean, I actually get nauseous thinking about drinking a glass of wine. Yeah. It does nothing for me anymore. And it was so freeing that day to experience that because it was like, I am finally free of this. Yeah. And I no longer need to have a drink. So that is so cool. And you're so right. Every story is so different because some people reach that extinction point very gradually where it's like they're having more alcohol free time, they're having more control. And it's more this like step by step approach to it. And then there's stories like yours where you're still drinking every day, but it's a really low amount. And then one day you're like, I guess I'm not going to drink or like, I'm so uninterested in you. I, I don't want to drink. And then you drink just two times after that. That's just, that's such a unique um, experience. So I have recently had a couple interviews with people who also kind of just abruptly quit drinking on the Sinclair method, not really planning to do it, but just getting to a place like you did where it was that, yeah, that kind of grosses, grosses you out. One person said drinking just started to feel like a chore. Like it was easier not to drink. I didn't feel like it. And so it's amazing how Naltrek some kind of, you know, winds down that motivation for a drink. Whereas before this treatment, I don't know about you, but I would have walked like two miles in the snow to get a bottle of wine, but now it's like, I can't yeah. even walk to the kitchen. It's so <laughs> unappealing. <laughs> it is. It's profound. It really is. And it's amazing how it works that way. You know, and I think the hardest part for me, because I never really planned on stopping drinking completely. When I started this method, I just wanted control over it. And I still would want to have some every now and then, you know. Um, but when it got to that point of extinction, I was the same way. I it, it no longer brought me anything that I enjoyed. And the first few times that I would go to functions where there was alcohol, um, even a bar restaurant, if we went with friends and stuff. It was kind of a fear, like, okay, I always took my pill because I'm like, well, I might have a drink, you know? Yeah. Um, but I would say more times than not, I wouldn't even have a drink. I would just have a glass of water or get a Pepsi. And it's kind of a fear for those of us that are drinkers that you're not going to be able to socialize as much or have as much fun. But it's amazing how I enjoyed it just as much and I didn't have the effects that some of the other people had the next morning, you know, and, and that was profound for me because that was always a fear. Like if I couldn't do this anymore, you know, be with my friends and, and socialize in this way. Um, I'm glad you brought that up too, because it is a common question or concern that people have, especially if drinking is a part of their friends group and just what they do. And, you know, maybe they're the life of the party. And I love what you said, like, you started showing up to these functions without naltrexone in your system, but you like brought it just in case you wanted to drink, but you found that you weren't always drinking in those settings. So it's like, it gives you the choice. It's not like, oh, I can't drink and everyone else can. It's like, I can drink. I just don't feel like it. And that becomes a totally different feeling because you don't feel like you're missing out on the fun because you're within your control and choosing not to drink. Would you say that that's true? Yes. Yes. And you know, it's interesting because we have a, my husband has a large family and they're wonderful people. And for years that would just, our, our get togethers at the holidays and, and birthdays and stuff, kind of alcohol was such a part of it. Okay. And I have to say, and I'm not saying it's me because I, I wasn't drinking anymore, but I have to say anymore, we get together. We don't drink alcohol at all anymore wow. as a family. And I think we've all just realized we don't need it to have fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be the fact that we're all getting older too. And it's just not, <laughs> we don't tolerate it as well, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's just so nice to be able to socialize and get together and have fun and not have to drink alcohol. Yeah. Was there a transition period for you kind of going from someone who was drinking in those settings to all of the sudden not drinking? Were there conversations you had to have with people? Was there any kind of awkward period of time or did you have to break off any friendships just kind of speak more to that I'm curious no I I didn't have any problems with relationships or having to break off relationships 
Um, I was so excited about what happened to me. I was telling everybody about it. <laughs> so they all knew what I had gone through. They were all surprised that I had struggled with it so bad because I had hit it so well. Yeah. But when they, when they realized that I was a problem for me and that I conquered it, they were all quite fascinated that there was such a method out there because everybody only knows of total sobriety in AA. That's all we know. And, um, so no, it was, it went pretty well. I mean, everybody accepted it. And I think people realized, um, through my experience of being able to enjoy everything without it, I think people are trying it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like too, in my experience, because I honestly had some fear around socializing without alcohol. Cause I was always the person bringing the alcohol and being up late every with everyone drinking. And I was like, well, that's who I've been around everyone for 10 years. Who am I now? And there was mm -hmm. definitely this transition period for me. But what I realized is that I was putting that pressure on myself to like, you know, be that person when everyone else, you know, sure, there were some conversations I had to have, but they didn't really care whether or not I was drinking. And it was like my own like mental trip that I was like, oh, everyone's going to judge me or something. But it, it wasn't that at all. And it's almost like I had to go through that to realize it. And I know lots of other people have that concern as well. Yeah. 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 Because we're so used to it. it it's so much a part of ourselves, yeah. I think. And then when you don't have that anymore, it, you know, it is a little bit of a transition, but actually it went pretty well for me. I have to say. That's good. You know, the yeah. one thing I want to recommend too, for people is the habit changing, yeah. changing your habits. And that was one thing that, um, I had heard so much about. And so when I was even going through that 16 months before I reached extinction, I really worked on habits. First of all, I kept a drink log from day one because I wanted to see that encouragement when I saw those numbers going down and that kept me going. Um, but I would also do things like I always had a glass of water and every time I took, took a drink of wine, I would take a lot of water. Um, sometimes I'd get up out of where I was sitting while I was drinking and go do something else for like 15 minutes and then come back. Um, my biggest fear, and this is interesting, my biggest fear was how am I ever going to enjoy watching a movie again without drinking wine? And, you know, it's, it's wonderful when I finally reached extinction and I could do that. And the, the interesting part about that is I now know how the movies end because <laughs> yeah. before when I drank, I could never tell you how it ended because I didn't remember. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm so glad you brought up the habit piece because I think oftentimes that's something, I mean, I was guilty of that. I was like, oh great, this medica medication is going to help me drink less. And I just honestly was putting it all on the pill and it did help me the first few months, but then it was a few months in where I realized the habit was at play. Like I, like you, I was a daily drinker. And so I was like, I noticed my craving is less for alcohol, but I'm still like taking now and pouring my wine and sitting on the couch. Like I'm still doing all of this behavior. And so like, I don't want to do that anymore. And what am I going to do now if I'm not drinking a bottle or two of wine to myself every night in front of Netflix? And so that, that was a process to change. And I think sometimes maybe people aren't aware of how important that is to do, but to your point, like, it's not like you were, you know, going out and signing up for a marathon. It's like, you were logging your drinks, you were having water between you were interrupting the habit that was going on. So it's not like you have to do anything major. It's just these little consistent things that can really help with the habit change. And I think that's really important for people like us who are daily drinkers, because it becomes so ingrained in our um, nightly or daily habitual routine. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. That made that it's like you said, the pill is part of the process, but changing our habits around drinking is such an important part too. Yeah. And I think that just made it easier for me to stick with it and to get through, through the, the whole thing. Yeah. So, yeah. And getting through that experience too, like you said, afraid of watching a movie without uh, alcohol. And there's like a million other things people can be afraid of doing without alcohol. But once you get through it and you see, oh, that wasn't a, actually as hard as I thought it'd be. And I actually liked it more. 
that just builds and builds and you kind of rediscover who you are outside of alcohol. And it's like, oh, I, I like this version of myself even more. Um, but we got to get through those fears, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting you talk about that because I am such a happier person now. Just the joy of not being controlled by something, waking up every day and feeling really good, having a good night's sleep the amount of energy and just the passion that I have for things that I gave up while I drank. I mean, I I gave up a lot that I used to enjoy because I couldn't enjoy anything anymore unless alcohol was involved. Exactly. And now to actually enjoy those things again, it's like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And to not feel while I was drinking, I struggled with depression because that's normal. First of all, you beat yourself up because you're like, well, I'm drinking too much and I tried to stop and I can't, you know, and it's a depressant, (laughs) you know, so I struggle with that. Yeah. So did you notice the depression kind of lift as you were drinking less? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I just felt so much better about myself and physically I felt better. And the same for me. I don't know if like, if there's kind of a saying out there, you know, it's like, you don't, for me, I didn't really know how bad I felt uh, with my drinking style until I started to feel better and more normal outside of TSM. Like I, or when I was on TSM, cause I used to wake up with like a heart pounding anxiety every morning, that anxiety. I would also get really deep periods of depression. And I just thought that was normal. Like people joke about anxiety and depression as if it's like a normal part of life. But as I drank less, it just started to lift. I was like, oh, I feel so much better now. And it sounds like it was the same for you also. Did did you know how bad you felt, I guess, before? Like, no, I don't think I did. I think, I think we just assume it's life and work and, and trying to keep up with the stress of life. And, and, you know, we were going through a lot with our son too, during that time. Um, so I don't think I did. And so that's why it was amazing when I was finally free of this. And even since I, you know, my extinction, I was in 2021 and these last two years have been remarkable because like I said, I don't drink anymore. Yeah. I maybe drank twice since then. And, um, I just feel so much better and I'm like, wow, I've been missing out on this. Yeah. Can you describe, since now you haven't drank in so long, can you describe what it's like to be alcohol free now versus when you talked about how you would try to take like a week or two off? Like what's the difference between you know, that period of trying to be alcohol free before TSM and then alcohol free now? Well, it's not a struggle now. I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, it was such a struggle when I was trying to do it um, before TSM because I just, my brain needed it. That was the only way I could be happy. And that was the only way I could deal with stress. And I had to learn, um, And I was even learning this going through my journey. I learned how to deal with stress in other ways. That was another habit change I had to do. So I I started walking a lot, which helped with obviously my weight and everything else and my mood. Um, And I would just, one of the other things I would do is, um, and since I've reached extinction, I still have stressful days because I'm still teaching junior high kids, okay? So what I do now is when I come home, I will literally just pour a glass of water and watch a sitcom that I love for half an hour to an hour. And it, I laugh and it picks me up and it just takes the edge of the stress off. And, um, that's what I do now. I, you know, obviously I don't even think about having a drink because I don't like it. It doesn't taste good. I don't enjoy, I don't even enjoy how it makes me feel when I used to enjoy the buzz so much. Now, if I ever, like I was at a wedding one time, I think I had two glasses of wine. And I started feeling that feeling and I'm like, oh no, 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 I'm not going there. And I started drinking water the rest of the night because I didn't like it anymore. Yeah. And that was a great thing about TSM, what it did for me that I couldn't do on my own before then I couldn't do it. And I had tried. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you describe that so well. It's like, um, it's really easy not to do something when you don't like it anymore, but that familiar buzz and everything that was so appealing before, but with naltrexone over time, you just, it loses its appeal and it's almost like disgusting. And yeah, the, the feeling like it's almost, 
I, I don't, I did not like the feeling anymore either. I remember my last drinking session, I had a half a glass of wine and I was like, I can't even finish this, which would have been like unheard of before. Um, and for you to talk also about the new coping skills, because I think that's a really big challenge that a lot of people face on naltrexone and TSM, because even with naltrexone on board, we can still get kind of the relaxation effects from the alcohol or the numbing effects, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you can learn these other coping styles that you gradually incorporate in, I mean, just you talking about pouring a glass of water and turning on a sitcom, I have found too, that watching a movie or a TV show, it's amazing how that can really be an escape out of the world. Cause like, I think we want to turn to alcohol a lot just to escape, but when you experience watching a TV show and you kind of go into their world for a bit and laugh, it, it really is its own healthier escape. And so for people to know that, you know, there are other things out there that we can kind of teach ourselves to to use as coping tools. And it, it might take some time to kind of adapt those things, but alcohol isn't, you know, the only answer, even though it does feel like that for a lot of us, especially when we start the method. Anything more you wanted to add there? Well, I just would say, I think when I drank and when I came home and I dealt with my stress by drinking, my stress was more severe when I drank. Like right now, I'm going through the same thing with kids. You know, it's actually getting more since COVID. We just are seeing more struggles with our students right now. So my stress level is probably a little bit higher. And it's interesting at school, like teachers will be like, oh, I can't wait to go home and have a drink, you know? But I'm really, even though I'm a stressed, I'm not stressed like I was before. My stress is a different, it, it just doesn't feel severe. And I think it's because I've learned to cope in other ways. And I, I think alcohol actually made my stress worse hmm. because I think it, it had that depression and anxiety factor involved in it. And I think it got me more stressed, you know, um, when I was drinking in excess mm -hmm. because I honestly, yeah, I have stressful days, but honestly, it's really not that bad. I mean, like right now, it's just not that bad, yeah. you know, and we're going through a lot right now. My, my one son's going through a divorce and, you know, we have an autism, uh, autistic grandson and, you know, so we're going through a lot, but you know what? It's okay. Yeah. I'm handling it very well. And uh, before I would have drank to deal with that. So I think drinking actually makes our stress worse. Yeah. <laughs> it compounds it. I really think so too. And it becomes like this crutch that we rely on. And so we're always anticipating when that relief is going to come. And for me, it was like my, my coping muscle just to be able to cope. Like we're naturally built to be able to cope with stress of life. Right. But when we rely on alcohol, our coping muscle kind of gets weakened over time. That's how I like to describe it. But as you kind of rebuild that coping muscle, you can go through the storms of life and be like, Hey, I trust myself. I can get through this. I can, you know, rely on God, or I know that that walk is going to make me feel better or that sitcom I'm going to watch or that hot bath. It's like, you, you can trust yourself again. You know, you're going to get through it and you have these other, other coping skills to rely on, as opposed to like, when is it going to be five o'clock so I can get home and open that bottle of wine. And then you wake up the next day and you're like, Oh, I feel terrible. And all the stress is still there. Yeah. I like how you put that, that we, when we drink that, that takes, place of that coping muscle, you know, coping with our stress, because we do have those mechanisms to do that without drinking. But when we drink that, that takes over that. Yeah. And that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we lose our, we lose practice with it and we don't practice something. We kind of forget how to do it, but it's really an, an incredible feeling when you can rely on yourself to cope and not rely on alcohol. Um, and you're that just like builds so much more self-confidence and trust in oneself, I think. Oh, yeah. such a good interview. Oh my goodness. Okay. So as we start to wrap up, I was curious to ask, um, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, some of the things that you, your hobbies and things that you like to do now that you couldn't really do before, uh, or, or while you were drinking excessively. So I was curious, you know, like, what does like life look like now compared to what it was like in your heavy drinking days? It sounds like when you were drinking a lot, you kind of race home and open up that bottle of wine and just kind of spend your night that way. You know, now how is life different, I guess, since you've gotten free from this? 
Um, I do a lot more. So like, I'm actually, I like making dinner now. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't really like to make dinner before because it interrupted my drinking. <laughs> So I'm, I'm actually kind of really into new recipes and trying to eat healthier for me, my fam, my husband. Um, so I do, I do that more cooking. I like, I walk, I do work out at a gym now. I did start that since getting over since extinction. So I work out three days at, with weights at a gym. Um, and that brings me great pleasure. Um, it's just, it just does something for you. You know, it yeah. really takes place a lot of that alcohol. Um, we do, we live on a lake, so we have a boat and there's an interesting uh, component too, because boating's always associated with a lot of drinking. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's kind of a spot on our lake where we all park our boats and, you know, people kind of get out in the water and, you know, a lot of our friends from the lake, you know, they have their alcohol and that's okay but I usually have my Pepsi or just a bottle of water. And like I said, I just don't even desire it. So it's not that big of a deal. And I still can enjoy socializing with them. And I feel great then too, you know? Um, so yeah, I just have incorporated a lot of things that I let go. Like I, I like scrapbooking in my photo albums of my grandkids. I have six grandkids, so I'm pretty busy with them. I'll watch them. You know, we watch them quite a bit when we can, and we'll take them to parks and, and things like that. But those are things that I couldn't do because I was always hung over yeah. before. I would or imagine like you would, Sunday, you would do them and not do them very well, or like be kind of like, I don't feel good. Yeah. Go play over there. I don't know if it was like that for you. Exactly. Yeah. When you're hung over, you don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. You just feel miserable. And you know, I wasn't enjoying those things anymore and they took a back burner and I have now brought them all back into my life and I'm loving it. That's incredible. Yeah. It just sounds like a really full and fulfilling life of just those simple things and those simple joys that we don't, we're not really aware of or as sensitive to when we're just numbing out with alcohol every day and chasing that next drink every day. It's like these simple things, family, cooking, friends, food, incorporating that in, into your life is so important, I think, for a fulfilling and healthy life. Yep, definitely. So what advice do you have for others who are watching this, you know, whether they're just starting out or they're in the middle of the Sinclair method, what advice would you have for people? Well, number one, you have to be complying hundred percent. You know, you have to take, you have to wait, take the pill and wait either. I usually did it 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and you, you just have to take the pill. You can't not, because I just, I don't know. And I don't know if I'm accurate on this, but I just felt like if you don't, if you only take it, sometimes you kind of take two steps forward, one step back. I mean, it's just, you're never really going to achieve the results that you can achieve with TSM unless yeah. you're hundred percent compliant. I would also make sure you're logging your drinks because I think that's good for, it's a good discipline for you. And then to see your progress and to, and to even see those, those times that I would spike up and, and having more than I normally had, like the two standard. And I remember talking to my doctor and he'd say, why do you think that happened then? You know, and we discussed that. And that, that was really eye opening for me to see what was going on during that time. Um, and then make those, um, drinking habit changes, you know, have a glass of water, uh, you know, do something else for 15 minutes, you know, whether it's even walking around your house outside, you know, just to, to break that cycle of that consistent drinking. And then to really begin um, to bring back some of the things that you gave up that you love. That's great advice. It really is because it's, it's both. You want to yes, be compliant and drink mindfully and change the habits around drinking, but then simultaneously start to fill in your life. You know, you're spending less time drinking. Well, what are you going to use with that precious time? How are you going to spend it? And I think that can be almost scary sometimes for people like, who am I if I don't drink from five to midnight every day, but starting right. to simultaneously build in those other um, things so that you can, you know, learn what life look, looks like outside of alcohol use disorder. And I think another thing is if you have a bad one, you know, if you have some bad times on it and you have some spikes 
and you over drink, you drink through the nail. Don't beat yourself up because mm -hmm. it really is part of the process. And there were times I could tell that my brain was really trying to get back control. I, I know they always refer to it as a lizard brain, okay. trying to maintain that control of the drinking, you know, and I could, I could really feel that happening to me and to, to be aware of that and to be like, okay, I got this. I, and even though I may have had more than I wanted to have tonight, I'm going to, I'll be fine. Yeah. And, and just keep compliant and keep working on those habits. Yeah. And, you know, it's absolutely amazing. And this was something that was said a lot on the Facebook pages. You'll be surprised, like, like all of a sudden one day, it'll just happen one day. And that's what it was for me. Huh. It was just, I was a, at least two, you know, two daily, two drinks a day, daily drinker. And then one day it just, it was off. I, huh. I wanted nothing to do with it. So it can happen just suddenly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to not lose heart, because I think sometimes people think, oh, if I'm not there in six months or even a year, it's not going to work. But I mean, you're an exact case study of it took you 16 months. And even at that, you know, it, it wasn't like it was obvious that that's where you were heading. It just happened one night. And so for people to, I always say time is your ally with this treatment. Like we want to give it enough time to work. It took us years or decades to develop these problems and it will take some time to um, unlearn these habits and behaviors as well. And I, I love that you had that perspective as well, that or, or even just that observation that, oh, I can see my brain kind of fighting back and looking for that extra buzz. And I think that's just part of this. Like, of course, it's going to try to rear its head over and over again and, and fight the medicine in some ways. And yes, there's going to be days where people drink too much. Like nobody's perfect. We're all human, but to have that perspective and mindset of just like, okay, yeah, that sucked. Why, why did it happen? What can I learn from it? And then move on and not try to dwell on it. Yep. Yep. Just, you know, I always tell people, keep the faith, yeah. just, just keep the faith, keep believing it's going to happen. And, and it will, and it does take time. Like I said, I was kind of hoping, you know, every, I was always like, well, this should be done in a year. I should be okay after 12 months. And, and then when I hit that milestone, I'm like, wait, wait, I'm still drinking a couple drinks every day. And my husband really encouraged me. And then he goes, well, you're doing the method, right? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, it'll happen. Wow. And it did you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Such an encouragement. It really, really is because I think sometimes we have this idealized version of what the method should be, even in the book, the cure for alcoholism, you know, it does talk about you should be cured in four to six months. And of course that was in the studies with the rats. And I, I think in some of the human trials as well, they saw some, you know, quicker results, but I would say it's more rare for people to get there at that place. And it's more like the year plus that people, uh, that it takes people to see this change. So um, yeah, I love your advice and, and your story is really powerful. And I know it's going to resonate with people. And I think one last thing is to, to really know what the method is. I mean, I, I'm a naturally kind of person. If, if there's a problem and I need to solve a problem, I research and I find out everything I can and I absorb it. Um, so like, I read the books, I've watched videos. I've, I was very much involved in the Facebook pages, just getting encouragement. You know, that was like our AA meeting, so to speak. Um, that just makes a world of difference to know that you're not alone. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. Jamie, thank you so much for this time together. I know it went by really fast. Are, are there any other final thoughts or anything you want to share before we wrap up for the evening? No, I think we've covered it all. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. I've really enjoyed chatting with you and I just wish you the best on the life you're going to live free from alcohol use disorder. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good right. night. Bye-bye.